So today what we're going to do is we are going to, you know, go over a few things that we touched on last week um, and then dive into a few other, um, if you will, concepts, precepts, things that are also important as we think through relationships and the way we need to think about relationships on while we're here on earth. Is that okay? All right. So let's just start with a word of prayer. Um, as always, when I'm here, I like to... Um, you know, commit myself, the word, into God's hand and invite the Holy Spirit by saying that these ought not to be my words. I believe that there is a word that God has for his people at this time, and I'm only a conduit through which that word um, will reach God's people. And so, Father Lord, we ask that you will be the author and the finisher of this word, that these words will not be mine, but indeed they will be enveloped by the Holy Spirit. And that, Father Lord, they will go and be a seed that will bear fruit in every life that is here today. To the glory of your name. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. All right. So the first thing that we need to do is establish why we're doing this. So relationship unpacked. If you went to most other churches, you went anywhere else. In fact, even here, it would have been very easy to just say, okay, um, you're trying to get married. Find the, you know, Proverbs 31 woman. Or you're trying to get married. Find a guy that is responsible and loving, right? But as a, or a Boaz, exactly. Um, as a disciple-making church, for us it's very important that the people who come here, and every time we come here, we receive, you know, foundational understanding. So that as we go out, we're not only able to share because, oh, when I went to church, my pastor said such and such. We have understanding for ourselves, and that allows us to go out equipped and charged and, you know, strengthened to know that, oh, indeed, we actually understand why we do the things that we do. And that's why we're taking this approach and treating this topic um, from where we're, we, um, we, we, currently, um, we currently are. So that's a decision that the pastoral leadership of this church has taken about how we treat every topic, including this one. Now, the first thing I want to say, and I want to establish very quickly, is that, um, and if you're, you're taking notes, this would be like point one that I think is very important for us to understand, is that our horizontal relationships, right, are defined from or flow from our vertical relationship. In other words, the way I relate to friends, family, um, children, um, what have you, all the people in my life must flow from and reflect my relationship with God, right? And if there's a disconnect, you will see it in the relationship I have with people. Um, the way I, I think about it, so think about it like this. I, the best analogy I came up with, and which is the other thing, I got into trouble with this last week, right? I have to say this right off the bat. Analogies, if you stretch them, will always break down, right? They will always break down. But you, it, it also helps sometimes. It's a good tool for helping people understand what you're saying. So um, most people who come to this church know David and Elsa, right? They're Pastor Lord and um, Agnes's kids, right? Now, most of us know David um, and Elsa because of our relationship with Pastor Lord and Agnes, right? Outside of them, we probably wouldn't know David and Elsa, right? Um, and so it stands to reason that whenever we interact with them, right, our relationship with them, the relationship we develop with them, ultimately must honor the relationship we have with their parents, right? And it's very similar when we think about our relationship generally with people, that it must honor our relationship with God. Because ultimately, um, you, know, this, this, you know, Scripture really asks us, if you, if you want to know a person, it's not the person that you're seeing in front of you, but who are they, who has God called them to be? And that's how we ought to really ought to, um, operate with people. Well, the same thing applies to um, our marriage or courting relationships, where when you think about that relationship that you have with the person, it really must flow from your understanding, because effectively, your relationship with them is an extension of your relationship with God. Okay? So, now that brings us to the, the topic of marriage and dating. Um, but in order for marriage to be, and dating to be understood, we must understand, you know, just 
sort of like the relationship between, um, shall we say, um, the male and female, which is where, um, so last week we read from Genesis 1.26. Um, I'm reading from the NLT again this year, um, this, this sermon. Um, if we can have that up as well, I'll quickly read. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay. Now, on the one hand, one can say that mankind, right, is one entity. However, here, here, here is, and I'll touch on that a little in, in a second because we, 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 we spoke about this a little bit last week. The scripture says, says to us that God created them male and female. And so what we know here is that while before God, the human race, mankind stands before God in solidarity, on the other hand, what it is is that we are made male and female, and it is as a collective, as a community of male and female that we reflect the image of God. In other words, if you just took, I don't know how to say it, the men's fellowship alone does not reflect the image of God. The women's fellowship alone does not reflect the image of God. As a collective working together, right, you, there, are, there are strengths and weaknesses in each one that together weave together and form. And when you look at that together, that then is the, a reflection of the image of God. Now, why is this important? It's important to say this because we need to understand that... Um, we need to understand this. Later on in Genesis 2, we'll talk about, and, and we'll get there, we'll talk about how woman was formed, right? But I, we're sharing this to establish that from the beginning, it was God's plan to make man male and female, right? Because ultimately, that is how the fullness of who God is is reflected. Now, the question here, somebody might ask, wait, does that mean that God is male or, and female? No, it does not, right? What it means is that you know, there are, there are attributes and, what do you call it, qualities of God that each of these human expressions carry, right? Mankind carries, and as a collective, we then reflect the image of God. Very important to, to establish that, right? In other words, right, and again, if you're taking notes, this is really the second point. God made mankind, male and female, to fully reflect the fullness and completeness of God. Okay. But... Here's where we also run into um, some, you know, confusion and people ask questions. Genesis 2.18, right? So Genesis 2.18 says, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. Now, here the, script, the, the, the scripture points to the fact that God took a view that a male-only expression of mankind was in some way not good. Okay. Now, at this point, it's important to... to, to wait, I'm, I'm very careful not to, to get to the, you know, the theology of it. But you will find that, so the accounts, in simple terms, um, Genesis 1, um, account of creation, just talks about the fact that God made them male and female. In Genesis 2, there is first, male is first made, and then female is then made. Okay. Now, the, the general consensus on, on, on this is, while the, the, the two... The, the two are seen as, so the first, Genesis 1, is a, shall we say, a generalist account of what is happening or the creation of the world. Whereas, um, G 
Genesis 2 speaks more specifically to the creation of man in the garden. So it's almost as if Genesis 2 is trying to offer commentary on Genesis 1, right? We won't get into all the details of it, but, um, you know, humor here. That's a summary of the, the difference between the two. Now, the question is, we, we, t- we talk about, so here's where some of the confusion is. The, um, he says, at last, man exclaimed, this is the bone from my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. Now, I said this, um, and I think a lot of the, the understanding and explanation people got was, oh, there was a woman living inside of man, right? Um, and that, if you t- accept that sort of thinking, that then just takes you down a can- another, a, you know, a rabbit hole for all intents and purposes. But if somebody says woman was pulled out of man, here's what I liken it to. So if we believe that there was one original man that God created, it stands to reason that every, shall we say, race that exists today was in that man when that man was created. So if you're of, you know, I don't know, Caucasian, um, Oriental, um, you know, you know, Hispanic, um, you know, so East Asian, African, European, whatever it is, all of these people were in that one man. So would it be right to say that, oh, there was an Indian man living in Adam? Oh, but there wasn't really an, an Indian man living in Adam, right? No. So that's not what we're saying. We're not saying that there was a physical, you know, Indian or Ghanaian man or, you know, a Shanti man or a man living inside of Adam. No. But all of, the, all of the, 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 the fullness of mankind was in that one being. And it is why, so think about it. If God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, he could have formed Eve from the dust of the earth too. Right? But what he decided was there was some essence there was, there was in Adam that he thought would be best used to create somebody who would be a suitable partner right, or a suitable helpmate for Adam. Very important to establish this. Now, here's the other thing. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us exactly why God said it is not good for man to be alone. But we can infer and perhaps deduce with our, as Pastor Lord would say, our spiritual imagination, right, that, one, it was that as, if it was, as when it was just a man, going off of Genesis 1, it didn't fully show or express the fullness of, you know, the image of God. Because we said in Genesis 1, he created a male and female to express the fullness of his image. So if you only have the male expression, that is not really the fullness of his image, right? But the other piece of it is that without woman, we know that man did not have a, a peer-like being with whom to interact and to, with, with, with whom to share the human experience, Okay. So clearly, from Adam's expression, when he, he screams out, and I love this translation, at last, the man exclaimed, this is, you know, um, our, our, our daughter is learning to speak. She's, what, 19 months now. Um, and I think one of the, her favorite expressions that she's, she's learned now is, aha, you know, um, very Ghanaian expression. But I think that's the, if this was written in, you know, in the Ghanaian sense, it, instead of at last, it would be, aha, you know, this is, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, right? But clearly, there was a deep desire within Adam for earthly companionship, right? Um, because, you know, and, and think about it this way. Effectively, what God had said by saying, you know, we'll find a suitable helper. He had gone through, the, there were stages. One, God had first said, well, no, on this earth, I'm, I'm your helper, Adam, but not quite like that, not what you, you need. And then he said, okay, there are the animals, I mean, but still not quite. And then we, we arrived on, yes, this is, we'll, we'll make woman, and she will be the, 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 um, the helper. So now here, I think this is another thing, for those of you who listened last week or were here last week, I liken this to um, Israel's, um, so first of all, like, let me establish, um, Adam, there was a clear desire and a clear need and a clear want for that so for somebody to interact with, for somebody to have relationship with. Hence the expression and hence the exclamation at last. And I liken this to Israel's request, right, for a king. 
um, when Saul was uh, made king of Israel. And like I said, every analogy, if you stretch it, breaks down. That analogy is not wrong per se, because what I was effectively saying is, well, when Israel, well, think about it, in the afterlife, right, God will be king of everything, correct? And so even if you ask for a king now, it is for a king while we are here on earth, okay? In much the same way, that desire that Adam was looking for was for earthly companionship, okay? But where that analogy breaks down is this. In the case of um, Israel, one could argue that Israel was rejecting God at the time. In this case, that was not what was happening with Adam. However, in fact, one could argue that marriage, if used and, um, properly, can actually bring one closer to God, right? Um, but at the same time, we know this. If we turn our Bibles to Matthew twenty-two thirty, 30, right? And this is Jesus speaking. So if, you're, if you have one of those red-letter Bibles, this would be in red, right? So he, he says this. He says, for when the dead rise... They will neither marry nor be given into marriage. In this respect, they will be like angels in heaven. So I ask, is marriage something that transcends our, you know, spiritual, or is it something that is for here on earth? It's for here on earth. Very good. So if I describe it as fleshly or carnal, it's not to say it is evil, but it's to say that it serves a purpose here on earth, right? Um... So in much the same way, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, 8 that, um, and of course, this is not red letter, so this is Paul, right? But now he says, now to the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Again, these two scriptures underscore the utility of marriage. And what it's effectively saying is that primarily marriage is for this life. Right? And it's not something that transcends our, into our, the spiritual world once we pass on to the next, to the next life. Um, now, this brings us to a key point that I was making last week in, my, um, in, in verse 24 of Genesis 2. Um, because this scripture, I think, is often misquoted, and I thought it was important to highlight this because it will free a lot of people from the way they think about marriage. Right, So it says... So this follows on from after, um, after Adam ex- exclaimed, at last, aha, I found the one I'm looking for. Okay, it says, at last, the man exclaimed, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Um, she will, shall be called woman because she was taken from man. And in 24, it says, this explains why. Now, notice this. This is not in parentheses. So this is not a quote, Right? And if you look all through Genesis, what you realize is when God is speaking, they will say, and God said, okay? So if, or, and even when Adam is speaking, they will say, and Adam, you know, it will be in parentheses. For example, if you go to 20, 23, 23, at last the man exclaimed, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Notice how they are all in parentheses, right? So you go over to 24. This is the commentary it's, 24 is not. This is the commentary of the author of the text who is saying, because of this thing that Adam did, right, and this is, or this he's saying, this is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now, here is the, 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 the thing that we want to um, establish. Now, Marriage in itself is not something that God prescribed as you must marry. At the same time, marriage is something that is blessed and sanctioned by God. Right? So it is not a prescription to say, hey, okay, if you are here on earth and you are not married, you are in some way inadequate or you are in some way not whole or you are in some way lacking something. Now, this is very important because there are so many people that are in bondage to this scripture and the interpretation of the scripture that has been used. That is not what the scripture is saying. What the scripture is saying is that this is the basis, and this is why people do indeed get married. And if you do, scripture is very clear, um, and probably talks about he who finds a wife finds a thing that is good. So last week, I started my sermon by saying right off the bat that marriage is a good thing. 
Okay. However, let's be clear. This is not something that is prescribed to say as a, you know, as a human being on earth. It's a must. Okay. And I, I talk about the fact that marriage is not prescribable, but it's blessed and sanctioned by God. If utilized properly, it can bring us closer to God as we mirror God's relationship with mankind in, um, in our relationships with our spouses. In fact, marriage, as we, 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 we learn, is that it is a typology and actually mirrors the relationship that we ought to have with God. And so if, you read, if we read from Ephesians 5.21... It talks, it, it, it talks about this, so um, let's keep going on. So, um, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Next verse. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord, right? Effectively, for, um, for a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Go on. And then husbands, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to your husbands in everything. 25. For husbands, this means love your wife just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. Effectively, what we're saying is that if indeed you're going to get married, remember what I was talking about, that our, what do you call it, our horizontal relationships must reflect our vertical relationships. So what we're there, they're, they're saying is, well, if you do choose to get married, look at this as the picture of God and the church, right? When, when Jesus Christ showed or when 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 God decided to show his love for us it cost him his son effectively it cost him his own life so you want to marry oh i love you okay cool yeah it's all well hunky dory everything is you know but let's just be clear that's the what you are called to follow that's the standard right fantastic now at the same time notice what paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.32, about, um, about um, marriage. And a married man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of the world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. And an unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of the world, how she can please her husband. This scripture clearly highlights, I'm not saying it all, it's in your Bible, that there is a certain level of, shall we say, dedication, single-mindedness, that a single person can have in their service to God that a, um, what do you call it, a married person cannot. Again, just as marriage is not prescribed, I also want to be clear, singlehood, well, I could argue that Paul is prescribing. Well, Paul actually says, if you can, but he says, if you can't, don't worry, you just marry. Okay. So, I, 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 I want us to establish something here. There is, this is an area where there is, the, the, the conventional thinking is, oh, you are X age and you're not married. And you are in there. Now, I understand that if it's something that your heart desires, right? Yes, pursue it, right? It, we know that this is something that, this is not something that God frowns upon. And so if you desire marriage, do pursue it. But at the same time, don't pursue it from a place of I am inadequate or I am lacking something. Last week I said something which I thought was very, it's profound, so I repeat it. Um, Marriage, if we're going off of these scriptures, marriage is not better than singlehood in much the same way that singlehood is not better than marriage. They both come with different blessings and challenges. So when you, when you go from being single to being married, you swap one set of blessings <laughs> and challenges for another set of blessings and challenges, right? That is, that, that is life, and I think it's, it's important that we let people know this, because especially in this, here's the one that actually floors me. I'm actually very surprised. I'm used to, maybe, you know, my socialization, I'm used to um, women, at least in my life, romanticizing marriage. But the one that's very surprises me is when men then also romanticize marriage, which I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more of as though it's, you know, it solves all your problems. 
As a married man, I can tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, to borrow, to borrow a, a, a political expression, if the fundamentals are weak, <laughs> marriage will expose you, right? No, that's a, you know, um, a quote from the last election cycle, um, but it had to do with the currency. But that's just by the way. Um, okay, so now that we have that, what am I saying, right? So that I, we can move on to, from this section. I want to, five things in summary. One, our horizontal relationship must reflect our vertical relationship with God. Two, God made mankind, made male and female, to fully reflect the fullness and completeness of God's image. Three, marriage is not prescribed by God, but it is blessed and sanctified by God. Okay. Four, marriage, when utilized properly, can actually bring us closer to God as it serves as a typology of the relationship God wants with his creation. And then five, God's plan is to be married to his creation as outlined in Isaiah 54, 5, which I didn't, can we put that up? Because I didn't, I didn't reference that scripture. Hey. Okay, for the creator will be your husband, the Lord of heavens, Amis is his name. He is your redeemer, the holy one of Israel, the God of all the earth. Amen. All right. Is that good so far? All right. We're all on the same page. All right. Pastor Lord won't get emails after this. <laughs> all right. Great. Um, actually, I'm just using this to buy time because for some reason my screen has frozen. <laughs> uh, yes. No, that's the way it works. You have to flow. It's such a weird thing. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Um, I honestly cannot. One moment, please. It's allowed there. Eh? All right. <laughs> All right. Um, fantastic. Now, once we've as established these foundational principles, right, the question then becomes, okay, as single people, what should we be focused on? And this is what people have been waiting to hear, okay, I'm not married yet. What should I be doing, right? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll delve into a, a number of these in a second, but if you're taking notes, these are the four things I would like for you to put down. One, focus on pursuing intimacy with God because you understand your relationship with others is an extension of your relationship with God. Now, here's the thing. What I just said will not mean anything to you if it sounds to you like something you hear people say in church all the time. But my prayer is that you actually catch the spirit behind what I'm saying. Focus on pursuing a relationship. Not, not, I didn't say focus on going to church. I said focus on pursuing a relationship with God because you understand that your relationship with God or your relationship with others is an extension of your relationship with God. In other words, the quality of your relationship with God will determine the quality of your relationship with people, including whoever you're in a, in, in, in a courting relationship or a marriage relationship with, right? And, you know, last week my wife was up here, and um, you know, I'll share more a, a little bit about this a little later in the sermon, but one of the things that I will say, and, you know, yes, maybe it's a bit of, I genuinely believe that one of the things that attracted me to my wife was my relationship with God. Not because, I mean, look. <laughs> no, and hear me out. Listen, you see, when you talk about relationship with God, people think that what you're talking about is, oh, how much you pray. Well, I mean, all of those things, but you see, here's the thing. How much you pray, how much you go to church, the, the, the issue we have or the challenge we have is people look at activity as a measure of somebody's relationship with God. Right? I don't know if we went to. It, it, when I met my wife, we sat in a what, cafe choir and had brunch, right? We're even eating pork sausages, as you know. It's all very spiritual, right? <laughs> well, well, no, yes, some, some might say that. We were, having, we were having brunch, but in the conversation, 
right? Um, and she shared a little bit, so maybe she'll come and share, up a little, share a little bit. But the questions I was asking here, I had, and we'll speak a little bit about that a little bit, I think I had a clear understanding of who God had called me to be. And so, my, again, one of the things that last week my wife shared as well was the fact that in that first, on that first date, the questions I was asking, she's like, how is this guy asking me these questions on the first date? Usually you wait a few months in. Because I had no time to waste because I was very clear on who I was and what it is that I was looking for. So do you have those things? Are we aligned in that regard or are we not? So let's keep it pushing. Thank you. <laughs> right. Now, the second thing is, focus on pursuing intimacy with God. Um, the second thing is, live out the life and purpose that God has called you to, rather than waiting to get married to start living. There are a lot of people who are waiting to get married before they start doing things, right? Um, and this is, this is especially so for the, the, the young ladies, right? Um, look, I believe God has given you a vision too. It is not about, okay, what, you know, what vision is God going to give to the person I get married to? You have a vision as well. There's something that God has called you to. And so focus on living that out, even as you wait to get married, as opposed to waiting to get married. The third thing is, be content in your singlehood, even as you desire marriage. Right? There is a tendency to be discontented. Now, this one... Is not in the back. But do you know, honestly, ladies, a little secret. And although also, it's actually for the guys, a little secret as well. When somebody is desperate to get married, do you know you can't tell? And do you know it's not a cute look? It's actually, ask, ask your friends, it's actually very off-putting. Right? When people are like, okay, yeah. Is that, is that all? So what I would say is, you know, um, yeah, we should, we, should, we, should, we should look at that. And then the fourth thing is, understand that, ah, this is also very interesting, right? And this is one of those ones where, you know, give me some rope. After I, I, I say it, give me a chance to explain. <laughs> <laughs> understand that because marriage is not prescribed and or promised to you, that effectively somebody has to choose to marry you and you have to choose to marry somebody. So the question I ask you is, why should somebody choose you? Right? Why should somebody choose you? Of all the fine girls and fine boys in Accra, right? What are you bringing to the table? Right? And we'll talk about that a, li a little more. So before I move on, because what I'm about to say, also, um, what do you call it? Um, it will be impacted by this. Last week, we got a question. Somebody asked whether... Um, okay, so in finding a partner, do we have soulmates? Okay. Interesting question, right? Now, here's the thing. So effectively, when you're talking about a soulmate, you're talking about, oh, this is somebody who you have been made for and th this other person has been made for. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Let's think about that for a second. If we have soulmates, right, it would mean that for everybody to marry, like, Everybody has to get their marriage decision right. Otherwise, nobody marries their soulmates. Because the moment, say for example, I, I marry um, Kelvin's soulmate. Now he now has to marry somebody else's soulmate. Who then has to marry somebody else and it cascades. So ultimately, one person, it's, it's the, the weakest link. One person gets it wrong and the whole thing is, is messed up. Right? So, I hope that, uh, that, that description you know, answers the question, no. However, it is possible for God to single out somebody and say, this person, like my wife, right? This person is specifically for you. So, yeah, make it happen. <laughs> it looks sharp, right? So that is, it's possible. But to say, oh, these are, this is my soulmate and that's my soulmate and that's this one soulmate. If I miss it, oh, I've missed it. Yeah, no, it doesn't work like that. Now, there are, in the marriage preparation phase, so again, I talked about those four things up, up there, but there are still four, four things that I think um, you should con we should all consider doing as we prepare for marriage. Now, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to list them so that even if I don't touch on it, 
you have them, and then um, I'll go through them one by one. One, pursue identity, right? Find your identity, right? Two, heal, right? People, we, we all underestimate how much baggage we are carrying, right? And we, a lot of us do not understand that your, 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 your mindset with respect to relationships is actually informed by things like your relationship with your father, things like your relationship with your mother, things like the relationship between your father and your mother. And so taking that a step back and saying, in the time preceding marriage, how do I heal, right, is very important. The third piece is serve God and serve others, right, in that time. And then finally, learn. And there's so many things that you need to, to learn. For example, um, conflict resolution. I've realized that a lot of people do not know how to de-escalate situations, right, and really get to the bottom of it. So arguments like, I very rarely like argue with anybody because either I, I do my best to try and get to the bottom of what, is, what are we really talking about here? Right? Is it just emotions flying around, or are there real issues to be dealt with? You know. So we'll talk about that in a second. But let me start with, and let me cover, quickly cover, um, pursue identity. Last week, I used an analogy, which I'll use again. If I came to any of you after church and said, hey, would you like a ride? The question would be, well, it depends. Where are, we, where are you going? Right? In much the same way, if you're going to ask somebody to, you know, hop in your, your car or your bandwagon, the question is, well, where are you going? And if you don't know where you are going, how can you take me where, to where I'm supposed to? And why am I sitting in your car? Right? For all you know, I'm going to, I don't know, um, Awoshi, but you're going to Medina. It's not going to work out. And so effectively, a good use of your time between now and when you get married is discovering your, purpose, your identity and your purpose. Now, there is, there is something that I see, right, um, and feel free to apply it to your lives. I be personally believe, and I apply this not just to human beings, I apply it to even businesses, and you can even apply it to countries, right? I say for any individual, for any country, for any business to be successful, it needs to be able to answer three questions. Who am I? Where am I going? How do I get there? And if you can't answer these three questions, as unfortunately Ghana can't, which is why we are praying tomorrow, praise him, All right? Then you'll just be going around in circles, right? It's the same thing, like this is, it's the same thing with, you know, saying, hey, I want to get married to somebody. Because if you know who you are, guess what? It even informs the type of person you say, I would like to get married to, okay? Now, let me also say this, for a lot of people, when you talk about identity and purpose, they immediately go to career, right? And I thought about what's the best way to, 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 um, to share on this. And I said, well, I'll use myself as an example, right? For me, if you ask me what is my purpose or what is my call, what is it? I know that I'm called to leadership in three areas, right? The church, the nation, and in serving young people. I haven't, I haven't, that's not a career. That is not a, it's not a, however, what I know is that whatever I'm doing, right, must in some way either be, it be in leadership serving the church, the, uh, what do you call it, the nation, or, and or young people, right? And if I can find myself in a situation where I can do all three in one area, like, I'm trying to do with Faith Driven Investor and Kwame, we need to have a conversation. Um, then, praise him. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but you see, here's the thing. It's not about a specific. So what that means is that my, the mindset that I, I use with this, if I find myself in, I don't know, the entertainment industry, it's, well, how am I serving the nation, young people, and the church? If I find myself in banking, how am I serving young people, the nation, and the church? If I find myself in fashion, how am I serving young people, the nation, and the church? 
it's not about a career or a specific vocation, right, or a title, okay? So I, I'd like us to all move away from that and start to think, like, what is it that I've been called to, right? But not only that, you see, when you're picking a, a partner, the other thing that you're looking to align on is your vision, where are we going, right, I talked about, but your values, what do I hold, what would I not compromise on? What is important to me, right? Even as it pertains to how you even raise up children in the future, right? What are the things that are very important to you, right? And here's a big one. Here's a big one that a lot of people don't talk, talk about. Do you recognize the value or the effort required? Because if you have a vision that you want to pursue, have you ever seen a vision that didn't require sacrifice? Okay. So the question is, if this is your vision and I want to pursue it, right, are you clear on what sacrifice is required? Such that when you meet somebody and you're articulating your, your vision to say, hey, here's where the God has laid on my heart, or what God has laid on my heart to do, right? But I recognize that it will require certain sacrifices here, right? So, um, you know, I can give multiple examples, but I won't, right? So that's one. Um, very quickly, let me touch on the other ones where time is fast spent. Is healing, right? I talked about that. I think it's a good exercise before you get married to say, okay, what are the prejudices? What are the, um, you know, I, look, the, the, the false beliefs that I hold to be true that impact my relationship with people, right? For example, we have a very, we have a very, very, you know, I won't say warped, but difficult view with respect to gender roles in this country, right? So there are a lot of people who it's like, ah, and it's not everybody. I think now a lot of people, more people are becoming more progressive, but there is a clear view on who should do the cooking, and there's a clear view on who should do the um, laundry and all of that. And you're like, well, where does that come from, right? And to what extent is this impacting my ability to build and develop and harness proper relationships with people? With the type of, because you, you see, to your point about who, where, who, you, who you are and where you are going. So you say, oh, I'm looking for, I don't know, let's say, for example, you want to be the president of the Republic of Ghana, Grace, and you are looking for somebody who can carry that vision with you. But at the same time, I'm looking for somebody who will also cook fresh meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then do the laundry. Uh, okay, cool. Best of luck to you. All right. Um, and I know this, I'm being very crude. It's like it's a very simplistic um, example. But the point is, we have to ask, for me, I, I actually, here's this, and as I'm saying it now, I recognize that perhaps I even haven't talked to um, my, so actually, let me share this example. You know, it's fairly personal, but I, it's something that I, 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 I think I can share. So I grew up with, so I grew up with, and I, I use this term advisedly, I grew up with my stepmother. I say I use that term advisedly because she's the woman who raised me, and for all intents and purposes, that's my mother. Okay. Now, as much as she's my mother, though, and she raised me and she, she was very loving, intimacy was not a thing. You know, she, she's, I mean, she was not too much of a, you know, a boss chick to say I love you. So she, you know, we, in my house, we say I love you, right? Um, but what's quality time? What's like, listen, I'm going to work, leave me alone, you know? And whether I know it or not, well, now I know it, that impacts even my, the way I interact with my wife, right? And so, one of the things that we all have to do, right? And you know, if my wife was here sharing, she will talk about her own things that she had to learn and unlearn, is we all have to go do that very painful process of saying, what are the views that I have concerning certain topics, and how do I let th those go, replace them with a godly view of these relationships so that I can build a healthy marriage and a healthy relationship 
um, even in, in the courting stage. All right, cool. Um, finally, very quickly, serve God and serve others. The guys who are, and I've seen it happen, and I'm not saying that now, Beatrice, so this is, this is basically, look, once one, a person gets married, it definitely becomes a lot more difficult to show up for rehearsals, Friday service, Sunday service, which doesn't mean that, I'm not giving you an excuse so that when it happens, you're like, yeah, Quabs, you said it. <laughs> it's, right. But it's a lot more difficult, right? And, especially, and when, once you have kids, oh, forget it. And so in this season, right, you can actually be a blessing to a community of believers by saying, you know what, I'm going to dedicate my time, my resources, my, in helping to bless this body of uh, um, believers. Because a time will come where I will no longer be able to serve in that way. I may be able to serve in other ways, but not in that way. And so when you fail to do that with your single time, you are depriving all of us of those gifts, those uh, blessings that have been deposited in you. So at this time, while you are still single, while you have, you know, lectures on only when Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays, right? Please think about and find ways to serve people and to serve the community of believers. And then finally, here's the thing that I'll say. Learn, right? Now, learn... I talked about three things. One, there are things like conflict resolution. Please learn how to. Um, last um, two weeks ago, I was sharing with Pastor Lord something very, very quickly. Um, the University of Ghana, the, Van, the Commonwealth Hell Hall um, guys were rioting or whatnot. And then the pro vice chancellor was doing an interview and I was listening to it. And I was so pained by the interview because I was like, this is not how you de escalate the situation. By effectively calling the, the students, like, yeah, dimwits. And it's like, this is not how you de-escalate. And I feel like so many people don't know how to do that. Right? So, you, yes, learn how to do it. Consultative decision making. We are all used to, because you're a single man, you're a single woman, making decisions on your own. Right? You now have to learn to say, how do I make decisions with people? And I'll give you an example. My wife and I have very, very, very different decision making styles. Right? For me, Wife likes to be it to be perfect, right? And especially my my wife likes interiors. So if you give her three months to decide what type of carpet we should get in the house, she will take. If you give her a year, she'll take a year. Me, I will leave the house today, and my decision by the time I'm coming back, <laughs> I have a carpet. <laughs> like why 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 is this taking too long, right? So the compromise is okay. Yeah, you have three weeks. <laughs> if it's not done in three weeks, I would, I would <laughs> take matters into my own hands. <laughs> Fair enough. And it's actually, I think it's worked. Oh, yeah, praise him. <laughs> so, yes, there's that. Um, budgeting is another thing. Um, domestic, you know, habits. You have bad habits. You leave the seats up. You don't screw the toothpaste. Charlie, those things annoy people. And it's like, if you can learn to stop doing that, just learn to stop doing it. We are all learning, hallelujah. Right? Um, but also, there's the other thing where it's like, learn outside of the things you need for marriage. Like just, the more you know, the more you've done, the more interesting you are. Right? Like, why? I think Pastor, Pastor Lord, were you the one who mentioned this about even traveling? Right? And we, when we say traveling, please just abuse of your mind of the fact that traveling means going abroad. You can travel within Ghana, right? Where? What? Why is even Auntie Edwina? Um, Keta. No, Keta is a really nice place. So they're building all these new, very, very fantastic. Like, you know, but I know some people, I won't mention names, that they are my friends. They know each other. We know each other. But yes, the point is, Explore. Here, the other thing that I, I, I also tell people is there are so many free conferences, seminars, and things that happen all the time. Events, if, what's it called? Events, the ticketing company. Event, Eventsbrite. 
listen, just create an account because at most of those events, they put them on there. And you can tell, so which ones are free? Go, show up at one. You know, start a conversation with somebody. Grow a network. Ask questions, thank you. Go and minister to somebody. No, please. You know. <laughs> it's part of it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right, yes, yes, yes. So you go to the Paystack FinTech event and go and start evangelizing. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, develop the relationship and then you know where it will go, 100%. But I think that we all should be doing a lot more of that, right? I said something on campus the last time we were there meeting with the young men, and I said, and I, I think it is true, and I, I would like to believe it for the entire church, right? That a time is coming on UPSA campus, on University of Ghana campus, that if you say you are dating somebody from Every Nation campus, ENC, which is the name of our campus ministry for those who don't know, it's a flex. And it's a flex because you are dating somebody who has a clear vision of who God has called them to be, right? Who is well-read and well-rounded, who has done the work to heal, who is serving people and serving God. So it's like, ah, won't pay without a day. Unless you don't, you have, you now you don't have a vision for yourself, right? But to the extent that you do, right? And I believe that for, for this church, and that is why we're going through this series the way we are. Because the goal is to build up people who, when the time comes for them to be married, when the time comes for them to be yoked with somebody, they are bringing the essence of God to that relationship because they have spent the time to develop and to cultivate that. Amen. Nah. Yeah, let's pray. Thank you. Yes. We'll take a few minutes to, um, to answer some questions. And just, can we appreciate Crops again? One of the reasons I asked him to start us off on this series is because he's quite um, gifted in, not just in teaching, but I think the clarity and also the practicality of, of um, things, of such subject matters. And I, I, very intentionally, it's been very practical because we have a very young congregation. Many of you are yet to marry. Also, a, a couple of um, young, you know, um, families. His last statement that when, as a church, right, even for our campus ministry, is... It's our, heart, it's our desire, it's our dream that when you are set to be from this ministry, it's almost like a stamp of approval of some sort. There's a certain school somewhere in Ghana, in Accra. I'll not mention the name of the school, and I'm not mention where. But part of their dream, and their motto, is to develop Christian gentlemen. And by and large, you can say that they've been successful in, in constantly repeating that moniker, by and large. So we are not just saying it, but we're dreaming it. And as we keep saying it, it will happen. Amen. Amen. Awesome. So let's take our questions. Uh, you can see the link up. Um, Cubs and MY will be here to answer the questions. I will facilitate. So if, but if, you, if you want to put up your hand as well, uh, please do that. However, we have, um, we have a question here. It says, for those who miss the preliminary steps of self-discovery and all that before marriage, how would you advise that they pursue that in light of marriage and working with someone else? Come up because I think it will be it will be recorded. It's been recorded. So um, my response to that would be: I think, I mean, the best time to have done it is before. But now that you're in in marriage, it's actually a great exercise to embark on with your partner. If you say, "Hey, um, let's 
Because it's actually an exercise. So if you think about it, even if God is very clear with you on what your purpose is, when you get married, the two have become one. And there is a need to share that vision, right? And both align on, okay, this is where as a, as a family, you know, this is what God has called us to. So if you've, you've, you haven't done that exercise prior and you're now you are in mari- you're already married, I think that it's actually something that I believe will build up your marriage by actually pursuing that with your spouse. Um, of course, there's, there, is, there is room to say, you know, there are things that God has placed in you that you also want to spend time, you know, fellowshipping with God to discover, right? But there's also an exercise to be done to say, okay, fine, how do we have a vision for ourselves in this marriage? So I encourage you, there are actually tools. I, off the top of my head, I, I can't think of any just yet, but I know that, um, like, my sort of like, Purpose, discovery, even something like um, um, finding the person called me, right? So Mami Sewa runs a program like that, right? Which is focused on really helping you find who you are. And perhaps if you do it as a couple, that may also help you to discover what God has called you to do as a, as a couple. Yeah. yeah. Just add to that by saying, you know, God is so gracious that when... Don't feel like there are a list of things. If I missed it, then I, I missed it. Okay, I've made out, missed out on some, something big. He has a way of aligning or realigning us, so long as you are aligning to his purposes. Okay, so let's say you didn't have the opportunity to do all this, and you are married. Like Christ is saying, even in your marriage, you can do that because the two have become one. So you can start the process of discovery. And you find that you might not have understood it, you might have not known all the, you know, all the combinations and all that. But once you are together, you will find that the purpose is in there. And as you both start to pursue that, um, that you know, that, um, or have that desire to discover what it is, you actually realize, oh, no, we are, we are quite a good match. You know, and this is, a, this, this is the reason why God has brought us together. It also helps you because then you don't keep going around in circles and, you know, you, you are set up for more success. What we are trying to do is to eliminate the risk. Are you getting me? And to set you up for greater success. Okay? Because somebody might ask, did, did that, some of our parents who are married for 40 years, did they do all this? <laughs> but we want to have healthier, stronger. Some of the challenges that we are going through now, they didn't face them. Okay? So, we are having a unique set of challenges as a generation and we want to make sure that we have it right. Okay. Um, I have a question here. Will we touch on divorce at any point in this series? I believe we will. Um, we are, when we do our panel uh, discussion, that entire service will be more an interactive service where we'll have a couple of married people up and we'll, um, we'll have, you can have, you know, the opportunity to engage and we'll address a couple of things. You made mention of conflict resolution. Will we have a sermon or teaching on, on that as we go through this series? Well, I think it's something to consider. It's something to consider. Yeah, that would probably suit more in a workshop um, from, so like a Saturday, uh, you know, how to it's not a skill that we, as a nation, we have, people don't know what to do when there's a conflict. Like, they either avoid it, or if there's a conflict, yeah, they will avoid you, or it's like, but everybody knows that there's something going on. So, there's a way to, you know, just get it over and done with. All right. Okay. Any other question that I think we might have opportunity for? Maybe two more. Okay, we have a hand at the back. Very good. Oh, comment as well. For those who have been married for a while, you can share your experience. You can, you know, drop some nuggets, um, stuff we can glean from. I know we have people who have been married for over three decades in the house and perhaps even more. So you can, you can share some of your experiences as well. Praise the Lord. Yes. I enjoy very much the, the, sermon, the teaching of my brother. God bless you, bro. Yeah, it's not easy, but it's well. <laughs> yes. 
I think uh, the, some of the problems comes where we are trying to make a choice. How to get the right choice. Sometimes I think we need the, the Holy Spirit, the intervention of the Holy Spirit, so that you will not make any false choice. Because making the false choice can be, you know, destroy the destiny and what, are, what you are saying right now, that are your purpose and your visions. So you have to engage sometimes before the the marriage or the the the, the 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 relationship, you have to develop some prayer life so that the help of Almighty will help you so that we will not make any false choice. And secondly, to um, I, I, I'm saying that we need more, you know, uh, help from the leadership. Sometimes how to uh, uh, approach or how to engage in a relationship as a Christian. Sometimes you may be thinking that, okay, how can I talk about love? How can I discuss something, you know, with a church member that maybe she's not ready or you are not, you know? Uh -huh. And then moreover too, uh, for, the, for the classes, by saying that your purpose must go according to someone's purpose, I want to help my brothers or my everybody that if you didn't get your class means the class are not, are not finished. You can, you can still be happy and drop up and get your class and feel happy and worship God. Because one thing is that you can't be, you can't be worshiping God in peace because of love or because of something. So I think they will help us. The leadership will help us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Victor. So, um, yes, I think very important point you've mentioned. Marriage is a spiritual thing, okay? It's a, it's a union. It's, like Cross said last week, it's a very unnatural thing to do, okay? Very, very unnatural thing to do. So, if you want to, um, to be married as a, as a believer, as a child of God, the father is involved. The father should be involved. Because you can easily um, make wrong choices, wrong decisions. It's only God who sees the, in the heart of, of men. I think those are some of the, as we go along in the, in the sermon series, we'll talk more about that. How even when you, are, you, are, you begin to um, identify somebody, the, um, uh, arriving at the decision, you know, uh, the prayer, and also how you seek godly counsel. These are all, all things to help. Because sometimes when emotions are involved, they can be very difficult. You can be praying. You, guys, you, guys, you saw her in your dream. But the scene that you saw in the dream, it was, <laughs> it was not God. It was just you just like the person. And you are seeing the person in your dream. doesn't mean that that's, God is saying that you should marry the person. Okay, So we will teach later on, on all the other um, elements as well that, you can, that can help you in, in arriving at the decision. And I think your second one was more on the, uh, on the practical side as well, how to help. I, I think if, if you're, you, are, you see someone you, you, and you don't know how to speak with them, you can, you can, you can come for coaching. <laughs> you can see any of the married people, any of the married men. Um, yeah, what else would you add to that, Cubs? Yes, yes, I, I mean... You can read up, you can, you can read, you can, but also just, I think, interacting with people, uh, if they are, it's, a, it's a shortcoming or you feel like it's an, inad an inadequacy you have, we learn all the time. We learn all the time. And so speaking with someone, you can just receive a couple of pointers. Oh, like this person? Oh, good, good. Why don't you ask them out for, uh, to see a movie or, you know, or... Whatever it is, you come for, come for, bring some, <laughs> drop some coins. You get some advice. I'll just show you. <laughs> I'll just all right, guys. Any, any, anybody, any of the married people want to drop? Uh, give us a one or two, I guess. Okay, can we have? All right, so, okay, go ahead. Yeah, um, hi, Jake. Take a question. Um, so, from my understanding of this, I got that. Um, some people are see, destined to get married and others aren't destined to get married. So if you are destined to get married and you choose that you don't want to get married, like is there any consequence or like 
No, I okay. Very good question. So, uh, please, what the question is very important. Again, uh, since we are here, if there's anything said in the sermon um, I, that's brought, generated a question, we will answer it. If you have a question like that, we're, we're going to answer it. So, please don't go away saying, you know, this is what you heard. If you're not sure, please ask before you leave here. We are actually. Um, over time now, but I'm still going to allow a couple of minutes because this is important. Okay. All right. Because you want to take that? All right. Okay. So, um, I, I, so the first thing is first is I don't believe anybody, we didn't say, remember we said marriage is not promised or what do you call it, prescribed for anybody. So there's no one who is destined to, to get married, right? Um, in fact, Paul, in his, what do you call it? In, 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 I've forgotten the scripture, but he talks about the fact that some are made, um, what do you call it, are born eunuchs, some are made, uh, um, you know, some, some, yes, some choose to be eunuchs. Effectively, some people may decide, you know what, I don't want to get married, right? And that's fine. However, however, right? We also want to be clear here. I think that our current culture perhaps provides a lot more laxity for that. Why? Because remember Paul's scripture in um, 1 Corinthians um, 7, he's talking about the fact that if you are, if you, what do you call it, you are burning with lust, then you should marry, right? A lot of people these days, we, 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 have, we live in a culture where you can burn with lust and engage your lustful desires without getting married. So it becomes very easy for most people to decide, you know what, I'm not going to get married. But let's be clear, right? There is a context within which, um, you know, our fleshly desires are to be fulfilled. And that is within the context of marriage. And so, yes, we are all, no one is, what do you call it, destined to get married or if marriage is not promised to anybody or is not prescribed to anybody, you are liberty to choose. But let's understand that what that also then goes with is you are effectively then um, committing to celibacy. Let me, let me add yes. a couple more. So yeah. in plain language, okay, you, you, you are a young man, you're a young woman, yes. you start having the desire for sex, get married. <laughs> You want to have kids? Get married. All of those are in the context of marriage. Not anything outside of that, you're off. So it's not about if that you forget about the destiny part. You you have the desire. You are you are as Paul would say, you are burning. Uh, you are in your loins. You are feeling the fire. Get married. Is that clear? Please, is that clear enough? Okay. So if you are in a relationship, that is the context. The objective is to, otherwise, what are you doing with my daughter? All right, if you want to have children, because some people will say, I don't want to get married, but I want a child. No. You are setting that child up for, because of your selfish desire, you want a child. You, you are setting the child up for, you know, a huge disadvantage in life. I, related to that, okay, there's one question. But very quickly, I think that's a very, very important point. Um, I think it's a very important point that Pastor Lord made at the end because I hear that a lot as well. Um, we all know people who grew up in single parent households, right? In fact, I'm sure there are many people here who grew up in single parent households. I know a lot of them. I don't know a lot of people who grew up in single parent households who would wish that they had that experience again. And so if that's the case, then we have to be very careful about being very sort of like casual about, oh yeah, I want kids, um, but I don't want to get married, knowing full well that people who have grown up in single parent households will not wish that experience on, you know, they, they didn't enjoy it, yeah. right? And so that's definitely something to um, consider. Yeah. You got mommy at the back. Please go ahead, please tell us your name and then Please drop us some nuggets. Nuggets, okay. Right. First nugget. Is this on? Yes. Okay. My name is Marilyn. It's green. It's green, yes. 
My name is Marilyn. My last name is Hoimi. My son David and his wife. Come. Yes. And I just want to say we're visiting for two weeks. I am totally blessed by what the word you gave these young people today. It is good. It is right on. It is you honor God and he will honor you. And I am blessed to hear that. Is that better? Okay. So I, I appreciate hearing all of those things. When I got married, I never heard any of that. <laughs> and, um, but we got married, and we've made every mistake you can make in the book. However, God is faithful. God is faithful to the desires of our heart. And one day I cried out to him, and I said, he told me, he says, call unto me, and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things that you do not. And he did that for my marriage. I looked at my children. We had done some things right, some things way off. But God is faithful. He, he's every man's healer. Not only was my, he, he my healer and my husband's healer, but I see him working in my children. And I see his blessing. And I see his calling come forth in them, even if we didn't necessarily do all the right things to promote that I see now, and I'm like trying to work overtime <laughs> to say, to promote them. And I, as a parent, to pray, pray, pray for your children, always speaking, speaking the blessing of God over them. And it's, it's his word comes to pass, his worth, his spirit, and life. And he just, he honors what we do for him. And I just want to say that back home, I work with people who are now at 40, 50 years old. Who am I? I don't know who I am before God. What is your relationship with God? I don't know. I mean, all of these things that you identified and all of the hurts of their past, they, just, they come flooding out and I'm just like, God's able. But it's like, it's good to know for you to tell them now deal with these things. And even if, you, even if you don't do it all right, God brings things up as we're ready to, to deal with them. And I just want to say, God's faithful. God bless you. I'm just very happy. And people are the same the world over. We deal with the same thing back home. It's fun. It's fun. So anyway, we've been married almost 48 years. Um, going. Still going Go forward. Yeah. So thank you very much for your word. So I'm, uh, hello. So I'm Libby's husband. That's how you know me. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to say, you know, um, something we forget is we say in church, God's way is the better way, and we don't act it. And so you wonder why even in the church there's a bad divorce rate. It's because we say it, but we don't act it. And I just, so I just want to encourage you guys, and I'm, I'm only 37 years married, but um, <laughs> when you do it the right way, or if you're not doing it the right way, you, you, you stop and you fix it. Then you can have a marriage like I think she has or a marriage like I have. We have an abundant marriage. It's worth it. So I just want to encourage you guys with that. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to end the service in a unique way. I'm going to ask Alan and Marilyn to pray for us. Is that okay? All right. Oh. Why don't you rise up on your feet? We've come to the end of the service. Don't miss, don't miss the next couple of weeks, okay? Um, it's going to still be very practical. We'll keep praying. We're trusting God that we will do it right. We'll have it right. Amen. All right. If you have that desire for marriage, God has that desire for you. All right? Okay. Father God, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for your presence here for today for the power of your word that was here today. Lord God, I thank you that you have a call on every person in this room, single or married. And Father, I thank you that you have the power to bring all things to pass that you have before them. I pray that the hearts are submissive to you, Father, that they lean into you and, and truly know that they are here with a specific purpose. They are not here by accident. You have a call in their life 
that you have great things in store for them. You have a place in the kingdom, Lord God, that you plan to bless. You plan to bless through them. They are your conduit, Lord God, to do all that you want done on this earth. And I thank you, Lord, for your spirit, Lord God. I pray that your spirit develops in each one of them, and every gift, every fruit is manifest. Every place they go, that they have become the light in the darkness. Every place they go, that who they are draws people to them, Lord, that they are just a total blessing to you because they are your child and you love them and that you, they will walk around emanating your love. It'll just flow like a conduit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for everything that you do and every, every purpose that you have here today. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we just, um, we feel your presence here today. Uh, we thank you for this church. Thank you for the, the word. Lord, this was truth today that is not spoken in a lot of churches. And so I just say, for especially for the young people here, just for those of us who have accepted Christ, we have, we have the Holy Spirit inside us. And just connect, connect to the Holy Spirit inside all these people to have them know <clears throat> whatever they're called to. If they're called to be single, Lord, grow them in that. If they're called to be married, but don't please give strength to not compromise. You've given us a way that is abundant and is the, is the life we want to live. And uh, I just pray that, that it can be, it not only can be done, it's the way, it's the way to be done. And so I just ask it for that to be rooted inside each of the people in here, Lord. So as we go out, help us just feel that truth. We thank you for the anointing of today. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>